Okay, thank you, and we will proceed. Over to you, Doreen. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this event. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, it's exciting to not just do an event for research, but to also show how we can publicize and give visibility to our research. You know, my thinking is always that research is costly, both in the time that we spend um, and in the money, of course, that we also invest in it. So it is vital that our research reaches the intended audience. And so this is one of the core purposes of this event, to find out how we as academics can leverage the expansive reach of social media in communicating and giving visibility to our research. Additionally, social media enables us to build our networks for both career purposes and otherwise. So for instance, the two speakers we have today, Dr. Bex Hewitt and Brian, uh, Professor Brian Honey, I connected with them on social media after meeting them at a, conf at a workshop and we've stayed in touch and today we are all benefiting from that connection. So social media is useful for connecting with people as well. So we're going to be looking at how to use social media for our career and to build our network as well. In terms of agenda, uh, we've just heard from Professor Lawton Smith about what um, what CIMR does and what the research center is about. And shortly I will um, attach a document when I have figured out how to do it <laughs> on, <laughs> on the teams. I was fiddling with the controls and I thought, oh, I have to lend that part. But I promise that the document will be there before the end of the event. So, and then we would also hear from Dr. Bex Hewitt, first of all, and she will focus particularly on Twitter and LinkedIn and other others that she considers important before um, passing on to Professor Brian Haney, who will be focusing specifically on LinkedIn. Uh, we will then have a panel discussion um, and then a general Q&A. So please put your questions in the chat box. So today's workshop will not just tell us the why and the how, but will conclude with a series of next steps. So we want you after this workshop to do something definitive from um, using what you have learned. So get ready for that as well. I am positive that we will all enjoy the sessions. So let me introduce um, Dr. Bex Hewitt. You know, um, it's, it's special because Bex is, she studied for her PhD part-time at Breckbeck. So she is an alumna of Breckbeck. We're claiming her and that is exciting because most of the events that I organize, we always try to bring in past alumni of Breckbeck as well. And but she has been working for 10 years as an HM. She worked as 10 years as an HR professional and then she proud to her academic career. So she's an associate professor in HRM in the Department of Organization and Personal Management in Rotterdam School of Management. Her research focuses on the interface between HR practices and people's everyday experiences at work. She believes passionately that HR should help people to experience positive working lives whilst also benefiting organizational effectiveness. Bex is also associate editor communications of the Human Resource Management Journal, where her role is to enhance the impact of the journal and research featured in it through communication channels. She's going to tell you all about it. So welcome, uh, Dr. Bex Hewitt. Thank you. Thanks. That was an amazing introduction. I don't think I could have done a better job myself, so I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, um, I, as uh, Dorian said uh, quite eloquently there, I uh, I'm currently coming to you from Rotterdam. Um, I am originally from the UK, as you can probably tell. And um, I'm here with two hats on. So uh, as Doreen mentioned, I am the communications editor for the Human Resource Management Journal and have been for the last um, three years. So I'm going to share a bit of kind of the behind the scenes um, perspective, uh, what I have learned through uh, kind of engaging from the journal side in, in social media communication, because I think that's very helpful for us to think then about how we disseminate our research, but also my own experiences as well. And yeah, as Doya mentioned, I am indeed an alum of Birkbeck. Uh, I did my PhD there part time, so uh, I'm very happy to be. I wish I was there in person, but I, sadly I'm not. But I will imagine that I am there in Bloomsbury with you. Um, so yeah, um, 
I, the, the final thing just to say is I've put my, my Twitter and my LinkedIn on there. Please feel free to connect with me. I do way more on LinkedIn than I do on Twitter, but um, you'd be very welcome to connect. So I just wanted to start um, off by talking a bit more about the, the kind of journal side of things. So just to give you a bit of context, I know perhaps not all of you will be familiar with the Human Resource Management Journal. Um, but we are um, one of the highest uh, kind of impact uh, HR journals out there. There's a few of us. Um, and we touch different areas of research, including industrial relations and the kind of HR side of things and a little bit of sort of organisational psychology as well. Um, so if you want to find out more about the journal, of course, I'm happy to talk about that. But I didn't want to talk too for too long about that because, of course, we're here talking about social media. Um, and I was brought into the journal. I was the I am the first communications editor um, because I think there's an increasing recognition from academic journals in the, the need to kind of be prominent uh, within be prominent on social media and to create content. And so the goals really of our engagement with social media are to increase the impact of individual papers. So, um, you know, people clicking to read the paper, of course, but also then hopefully citing the paper. More broadly, to uh, increase the impact of the journal through those citations of individual papers, but also to raise the general profile of the journal, because, of course, we not only want people to read and cite the journal, but we also want people to submit high quality work to our journal and, of course, to review it as well. So um, some of the engagement, which I'm, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, um, is also just about promoting the journal in general and just making people aware of its existence. And the final one, which is a little bit more difficult to achieve, to be honest, from the journal perspective, but this is, I think, where you all, where we all come in, is about creating research dialogue, because I think this is kind of easier from the researcher perspective. Um, I mentioned already that we, we sort of focus on two particular outlets, Twitter and LinkedIn. So I'm going to give you a bit of insight about what I've learned from those two different outlets. And also um, just to say that if you look at our social media, you'll see we get a, what I, I share a wide range of content. So some of it is just specific papers. Sometimes things come from the editors. So, for example, calls for papers. Sometimes things come from the publisher themselves, from Wiley, if they've got um, content to share. And we also have partners that we work with. So, for example, the Chartered Institute of Personnel and Development uh, in the UK um, and those kind of things. So we sort of also try and um, engage as part of the wider community through our social media. Um, so just as I, I mentioned already that we have these two different um, uh, kind of accounts that we use and I just thought it would be worth reflecting on what I've noticed about the differences between them because this might be something that you're interested in. So what you'll see here is um, we start on the left hand side LinkedIn. Um, we have a lot of followers on LinkedIn, 46,000 people follow us. Um, each post gets between 10, 5 to 10,000 views. Um, it's difficult to know what that view could be because it could just be someone scrolling past it. It may just have appeared on their news feed. Um, we can, and again, I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. You can sort of see how people also are clicking on things and how much they're engaging with things, whether they're liking and sharing, for example. But um, my strategy on LinkedIn is slightly different to Twitter. So on LinkedIn, um, I'm much more selective about the posts that I share. Um, so. I, I, I am going to assume that you all know broadly what LinkedIn is or because you, you can find out for yourselves if you don't, but you'll know that on LinkedIn you can provide more detail than you can on Twitter. So you can provide a richer kind of uh, richer posts. Um, and so what I tend to do there is pick the papers which I think are um, particularly appealing to a practitioner audience. So they may just have a really cool story or a really cool context or just something which I think will get a, a general interest. Um, uh, I also um, pick things which I think might be, might create sort of discussion and debate amongst academics. Um, so perhaps sometimes we, we have as part of the journal something we call our provocation series. So this is kind of an essay where an academic will challenge some conventional wisdom. And those I think are really great for creating dialogue. So then I try and also post those on LinkedIn. And of course, things like calls for paper, those kind of things. Um, yeah, and then and then Twitter. So we have fewer followers on Twitter. We have just under 6,000 followers, which is still pretty good. I'm still pleased with that, <laughs> considering it's only been three years. Um, 
on average, we get, as you'll see there, 600 to 1,000 impressions, so people seeing that tweet every day. Um, and I have a different strategy there in that I keep constant content. So again, if you're on Twitter, you'll know that um, with Twitter, it tends to be that posts sort of fly by. You know, it'll appear on, on your Twitter feed and then it'll just disappear and you won't see it again. With LinkedIn, it's slightly different because you're more likely to see posts again and again. They, um, if people have liked them or commented, they're more, they are more prominent on LinkedIn. Twitter does also have that algorithm as well. It does have kind of a, a, a process of promoting things, but it's, it, uh, it's not quite as um, sort of sensitive. So Twitter feed, Twitter tends to be more temporally dynamic effectively. So what I tend to do there is I try and tweet every day. Um, and I'm going to talk to you later about how I do that without creating a huge amount of workload because I do not have the capacity to write a tweet every day, considering this is not my main job. Um, and uh, yeah, so each tweet that I send every time I share a paper, I schedule it and that's what I'll talk about later so that it, it'll be shared two or three times so that I'm kind of constantly putting content out and I'll come back to that point later. Um, I just wanted to say something about our audience. So um, I have noticed that we in general have more practitioners and academics engaging with us, particularly on LinkedIn. Um, I'll be interested in, in Brian's take on this later, but I have noticed, I think, a, a kind of growth in academic dialogue on LinkedIn, um, but I think it's still a relatively narrow audience. I've also noticed that um, our audience tends to be primarily from Europe and Australia. So um, we, are, we get fewer people from the US and that's partly due to the nature of the journal because it's a European journal and we have sort of a rival journal that's more American. Um, but that's kind of an interesting reflection as well. And uh, one thing I thought would be quite interesting, I'm gonna come back to this a couple of times with different insights, is what do people share? Uh, or what gets interest rather, because if you're thinking about how you create content, um, you want to have a think about, well, how do I create that content? And so I've just picked three tweets here, which got uh, quite a lot of interest. So you'll see the one on the left was the most uh, popular. Um, and this one is something which I think is general interest. So this is an announcement of a new issue. And so, of course, within within when we submit up, when we publish a whole issue of the journal. There's many papers within there. Uh, and so it tends to get more interest. So you'll see here it says 264 engagements, and that means people who uh, clicked on the link or liked it or shared it. So that's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, one thing to note, uh, so you'll see that I've tagged people in it. So on the left hand side here, I've tagged Wiley Business. So there are publishers, they will then reshare it. I've also tagged Martin, who is our special issue editor, so that he can also reshare it to his network. The one in the middle here is a bit different. Um, so again, this is a call for papers. So that's also something which gets a lot of interest. But I want this to be shared very widely. That's my goal with this. So I've tagged a lot of different people in here. You'll see I've tagged BAM, for example, um, and different kind of different um, associations and scholarly societies that we would be associated with that their members might be interested in. Um, and I've also used hashtags as well. And this is one thing I just wanted to talk a little bit about because I think um, this is something to really think about. And again, I'll come back to this a little bit later, is um, when you're creating content is thinking who is your audience and what hashtags are they using? So here, for example, I decided particularly that inclusion, exclusion and digitized would be hashtags which people may have interest in. And you may or may not know that on Twitter you can follow a hashtag. So if you have a particular interest in inclusion, for example, you can follow inclusion and then any, any time anyone hashtags inclusion, you will get that tweet. So I try and use these a little bit sparingly because I think it makes it more difficult to read if you have too many, but I use them where I think there is an audience for that. Um, and the one on the right hand side um, is uh, kind of an interesting one because this is an individual paper. So again, it's different from the other two, but this one got a lot of interest. And I think there's a couple of different reasons for that. I think it's just, uh, generally very interesting and I think that you can't get away from that it's way more in uh, more interesting research is going to get more uh, more interest um, but it's also one thing that I reflected on here it was quite easy for me to share the content because of course I am not a specialist in all of the papers that we publish 
and sometimes it's quite difficult and I've got some tips later for how you can help journals but sometimes it's quite difficult for me to identify what the key messages are whereas here I was quite e easily be it was quite easy for me to identify kind of what their main message was um, and I think that's partly why that got a lot of interest as well. You'll see here that I didn't tag the authors. On Twitter, it's very difficult to find people. So um, again, I've got a tip later for how you can kind of make sure that you are findable for journals that you're publishing in as well. And I just wanted to also share this. Um, so you may not know this. The most important bit this slide, I think, actually, is the bit at the top. If you are on Twitter, you can look at your own analytics. Um, so all you need to do is put it in this address and your Twitter ID goes in the bit that I've highlighted in yellow and then you can get some insights. So you'll see this this uh, graph here is uh, from the spring. Um, I think last year actually, <laughs> but you can um, you can just uh, select a different periods and here I've selected a 28 day period. You can see we had one day of spike and you can actually click into that. So here, for example, we, I shared two tweets on that day and they were both very high impact tweets because one of them was about the latest issue and I've already mentioned that gets a lot of interest. But the one at the top was a very personal story about a former editor in chief who sadly died. Uh, but because it was a very personal story, a lot of people had connection with it. You'll see that 20,000 people saw that and 300 people shared it or liked it. Now, of course, uh, that's a very extreme example, but the reason I wanted to highlight it here is because um, it's kind of uh, uh, signals, uh, and again, I'll come back to this, that personal stories really make a difference on social media. I've really noticed that when I when we talk about a person, an editor or uh, a particular author, these things tend to get far more interest. People will read them. The question, of course, is whether that is what you want. Uh, that's not sharing research content. But if you're trying to think about how you create a community and how you um, encourage people to follow you and engage with you, occasional personal stories may be something to really think about. Um, uh, and I mentioned that LinkedIn is is kind of different. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm looking at the time, I'm running out a little bit. So the, the important thing here is, as I said, it's kind of richer content. I can tell more of a story. I don't have to summarise it in so succinctly, and that makes it much easier to create uh, content. You, it's also much, much easier to tag authors, so I always try and tag people if I can find them. And again, you can use hashtags very effectively on LinkedIn. So all these principles from Twitter are the same, but LinkedIn is kind of easier to do these things, I would say. And the one on the right is another example of a personal story. So this was about a new editor, one editor leaving, one editor joining. Uh, and again, this personal story really gets a lot of interest. So it really raises the profile of the journal. And again, if you're thinking about how you create a community, these personal stories are valid for. Um, LinkedIn also provides you with analytics. There are paid services where you could look at it. Um, I, I don't do that. These are just free ones. It's a little bit more clunky, you have to kind of, but you can go to this link at the top and you can just have a look at individual posts. And so just to highlight some interesting things here, I can look at these posts which were getting a lot of reactions. So you can see 102 reactions means that's people who liked it or whatever. Seven people commented. And then uh, I've highlighted at the bottom that I can sort of see that we do have a decent proportion of kind of ac our academic audience. So professors or students who are looking at these. So that's really good news for me. So periodically I go in and just review the posts that I'm sharing just to see that they're kind of targeting the right audience and that they are getting some interest. So again, you can do that with your posts and I'd encourage you to think about doing so. Um, OK, so the, the, the next section and the final part, I want to talk just about some kind of more content about what you can do. Um, so the first thing is if you are publishing in a journal, please, please, please don't neglect the implications for practice. <laughs> it's very easy, I think, when you get to the end of a paper to just uh, think, OK, fine, 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 I'll write something. Um, if your journal that you're publishing in has a communications editor like me, they will use that implications of practice uh, because that is the most understandable way to share this. Um, in HRMJ, for example, we have this section I've just given you a screenshot of, which are the um, practitioner notes. And this is hugely helpful, but sometimes, I'll be honest, they're quite poor. And I really struggle to share papers when they're poor. And I've actually got to the point now where if I can't share a paper, I won't because I it's it's very hard. If it's hard work for me to read the paper, then it's going to be hard work for other people. Um, 
I've also noticed from my own publishing that a lot of journals now ask for your LinkedIn accounts, uh, oh, sorry, your social media accounts, Twitter or LinkedIn. If you're asked and you have one, please share it because that means that the journal can also tag you in it. Um, and if you share content, tag the journal or the publisher because they can also share it. So just again, it's kind of making sure that you help journals to share content for you. And um, I also just wanted to give you a couple of tips about kind of creating content beyond the paper itself. Uh, and these come from my own experience. So this one here you'll see is a paper I published uh, last year in the Journal of Management with some colleagues. And what the video that just played on the right is um, one that we just worked with some graphic designers at King's because we had a bit of budget. Uh, and we created this little video for it. It's a tiny, it's very, very short, only a few seconds long, but it means that when I was sharing on social media as myself, I can share this image and it just, it makes it pop. It makes it stand out for people. So that was, that's the first thing. If you, if you have budget or I guess my number one tip would be, please speak to your marketing department because they can help you and see what they have available. And this didn't cost us very much money to produce it. So that's one idea. You can create uh, appealing visuals. The second thing is about making it more understandable. And I know um, I heard from Helen and Doyne that you uh, also within uh, the CIMR, you have a relationship with Forbes as we do at RSM. Um, and uh, so we can, I can work with our press team, our marketing team to write content, which then gets published on Forbes. And so I've done that with a few of my, diff of my papers. This is one example, the same paper. I wrote an article for Forbes, uh, which is just targeted at practitioners. And it makes it just much easier to share. So I now do this as a matter of course. If I publish a paper, I will speak to our press team about what, how can I get that out there? And this paper, for example, was also picked up in the Irish Times and on a couple of smaller kind of blog type websites. Um, yeah, so, so I think just if you want to increase your impact, you don't have to do it all yourself. There are people that can help you. Um, and your, your marketing team, I would guess, would be normally the right people to speak to. And the other thing to say is that you can also create a story. So here, for example, I have two papers on the left hand side, which are sort of related. Um, and they're, yeah, they're both about kind of the boundaries between work and home. And of course, pandemic happened. Those boundaries became more salient for all of us. So then I wrote an article for Forbes where I synthesized these two bits of research into four steps, which is, you know, uh, <laughs> obviously that's a massive simplification, but it was very helpful for me to think, OK, well, if I just had to give four tips based on this research, what would I give? Um, and so they are evidence based, which I think is really important. And again, that went on Forbes and got quite a lot of interest. I uh, was interviewed for um, The Telegraph and The Guardian because I'd had it on Forbes. So people then knew that it was a special area of specialism for me. Um, I also just wanted to say something quickly about video abstracts. So um, uh, Wiley, for example, who published uh, HRMJ, uh, can produce video abstracts. It costs a lot of money, I'll be honest, but you can do it yourself as well. So if you have budget available, you can pay for Wiley to do it or your publisher to do it if they have it available. So this is an example. This paper here um, was published at the end of 2019. It's already been cited 91 times. Footnote, it's a really good paper and it won the won the best paper award. So I also think the content is very important. But this video I use in my teaching with my students because I think it's really helpful and I know other people do as well. So if you create content based on your research that people can use, it's going to increase the impact of that research. OK, finishing off then, um, I think, oh yeah, I do have three more slides, I think, but finishing off, um, building your audience is very important and I've got two tips that I'll follow up with that in a second. The second thing is about reposting and, and scheduling and timing. So there are tools out there such as Hootsuite and TweetDeck, they're just two that I use, and you can use them to, to schedule posts. So for me, for example, I will do HRM, HRMJ activities every two weeks and I will go and schedule all my posts to share. Um, and just think about the timing. So if you're targeting the UK and Europe, obviously think about when will people read stuff. If you're going for the US, you need to time things differently, that kind of stuff. 
Um, using images is very, very important. You, um, I've linked, I've given you a link here to the LSE Impact blog. This is also a really, really nice source of information because they do research and they produce, uh, they uh, kind of share insights about creating impact. And one of the insights they shared was that humans are visual and are 80% more likely to read text when it has an image. So just think about images. And I've given you two suggestions here. Pixabay and Upsplash are both free image sites. So you can just search. Here I just searched for uh, visual and I came up with a nice eye. Um, and I mentioned the bit about community. I think it's important to remember. So I think of LinkedIn as like my Rolodex, old school style. Um, every time I meet anyone or connect with anyone, it goes on LinkedIn. So they are my community and I have different sub communities on there. And it's important just to think about who you're talking to, how do you talk to them, um, using things like hashtags I mentioned, but also thinking about where are subgroups, are there communities on LinkedIn, just spending a bit of time kind of working out who your audience are is important. And you can also create your own audience. So um, I just picked two examples from my field about kind of um, academics who do this quite nicely. And I've linked their names to their LinkedIn accounts. You can have a look. Uh, Neil's on the left there. He summarizes papers, uh, which is really nice. Um, as he reads them, he gives a quick summary. And Andrew writes his own blog and then he shares it. So you can kind of create your own content without it being hugely in depth. So I just wanted to leave you with that. Suggestion, and that's the end. Sorry, I whizzed through the last bit because I could see I'd run out of time a while ago. No, that was fabulous. And don't worry about the time. I'm sure we are all forgiving because <laughs> you have such great insights. And I'm assuming you're um, going to share, we can share the slides with the attendees. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally fine. Yeah, yes, because yeah. there are loads of questions for you um, in the chat box. And I'm wondering, do you want to tackle the questions now or should we listen to Brian and perhaps- Let's listen to Brian. And I can maybe, then I could have a read through while Brian's talking and then we can talk about it in the discussion probably is best, if that's okay. Okay, thank you so much, Bex, for that insightful presentation. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I always like to write one word when I hear a presentation because, of course, we can't act on everything. And one word I heard clearly was audience. Audience. It, it determines the time you post, what you post, the hashtags you use, the type of um, media you use, whether you're using videos or you're using text or pictures. So I'm going to take that and put it in caps and put it on my <laughs> on my notice board here in the office. Audience, remember your audience. So thank you so much, Bex, for that. No problem. OK, so and um, we're going to move on to Brian. Move on sounds like an awkward thing to say. Sorry. The next speaker is Professor Brian um, Haney. And like uh, Bex, I met Brian at a workshop as well and connected with him on um, LinkedIn. And at that workshop, he had talked about uh, social media. So I always uh, look at what Brian is posting on social media. Uh, spe specifically LinkedIn and use it to inform the sort of things that I think I should post as well. So just as by way of introduction, uh, Bran is professor in strategy and HRM at DCU Business School, where he is also the founder and pro program director of the BSc in digital business and innovation. And he's also the former program director of the award-winning MSc in HRM. Brand's research focuses on the intersection of strategy and HRM, with particular focus on SMEs, growth, and knowledge intensive sectors. His research has received over 15 best paper awards and is widely published. He is the author of several books, including Strategy and Strategist, and also the edited collections of the Global Bookcase. I'm sure he's going to tell you more about his research, but today Brian is going to focus on LinkedIn as a way of giving research visibility through social media. Over to you, Brian. Thank you uh, so much for the uh, the introduction, and uh, it's it's a hard act to follow, Bex, uh, after uh, that great presentation. Um, just checking, you can see the screen and everything okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Perfect. Um, well, you're not in presenter mode. I don't know whether you want to click present, um, slideshow or something. Uh, yeah. Um, is that any different? Or? Um, not yet. You've clicked it, but nothing is happening yet. I'm working off two screens here, so maybe this, uh. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> okay, so let's see. So it's not presenting. It might be presenting on screen two. 
um, if you can drag it back to screen one and it should be fine. Um, well, if you, can you see it a little bit, even if it's on the? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, because I, I probably won't uh, get the technical detail right. Um, well, look, th thanks for the opportunity. Um, I, I'm going to focus on on LinkedIn and just, I suppose, some some ticks, trips, and tips, and 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 see how we get on. And um, I see there's really interesting conversations in the chat, and I think Bex has made some some really good points already around um, visibility and, and getting out there with your work. Um, I suppose this is the era that we live in. Um, both for students and increasingly for companies where we're constantly online. So you probably have to think about going to where your, your audience is. And, and I suppose that's why the attraction and thinking about social media is, is so significant. Um, just to emphasize for this presentation as well, I suppose, I'm, I'm in no way, obviously, very clearly here, a, a technical expert. Uh, and, and I don't believe my way is the best way or the only way. It's simply the way that I know. So. Uh, a lot of the examples I'll use will be my own examples, and that's simply because I have access to them and I know how they work or don't work. So uh, you could could look at this and go, oh, my God, this guy's got such a big ego. But I'm, I'm simply just drawing on what I have easiest access to. So um, that, that's the purpose. So um, I'm interested in the conversation after as well. Um, and and Diane, you, you you stole my story there, but I think it is really important about how people connect these days and, and it is largely through social media so already I've connected with Jeremy in the room here uh, on LinkedIn so it, it tends to be the way that we sort of can continue conversations in, in a different manner particularly and even pre-pandemic when we weren't uh, face to face. So um, LinkedIn, uh, it's a professional network platform. Um, I'm, I'm not paid or funded or sponsored by LinkedIn at all, just to clarify, because I'll emphasize it quite a lot here. Um, there's about 810 million users on LinkedIn and about 40% of them use LinkedIn every single day. Uh, there's, LinkedIn is in around 200 companies, uh, countries. 57 million uh, companies and 120,000 schools. So look, there's a big network and there's a lot going on on the platform. And um, I think Bex mentioned it there at the end, the personal story seems to make the difference on LinkedIn. This is one of my uh, most popular posts and um, it was our first day opening post pandemic and, and inviting students back. And I just saw our marketing team had done an absolute fantastic job just on the stairs going in into the business school and I thought look I'll, I'll put that up and I just put a little sort of steps in the right direction and it uh, really reson really resonated with people in terms sorry, of sorry to interrupt you Brian your slides are not moving um so we're still on the first slide yes no yeah thank okay. you okay maybe I'll do it this way then um can you see that now yeah yes we can OK, thanks. Uh, and, and do let me know if that happens again, because I'm, I'm just having a difficulty here. Um, yeah, so that was something that obviously got traction and um, I think about 20,000 uh, likes on it or, or views and a lot of comments and other companies saying that's such a great idea. Welcome back. Um, so it is about. Personal messaging and, 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 and getting getting the message out there in terms of who your audience is and, and the school were obviously we reshared then this across faculty so um, it was important in that way too. So um, just checking you can see that slide now. I've moved on to the next slide. No we can't yeah I think you might have to do the click thing you did. Okay. Yep. Okay, I'll do that each time so sorry. <laughs> okay so I've, I've got seven C's right for um, for LinkedIn and, and the first one is around choice and I suppose that's the idea that you can't be all things to all people. So what is the platform that you recognize, you use, uh, you have a preference for, you feel comfortable for or if you're going to use a suite of platforms, Bex mentioned some of the tools in terms of Hootsuite and those type of things that you can manage it because this can become all consuming. So you can try to be all things to all people and as a result, be nothing to nobody. So it is important. And for me, some of those choices are social media is addictive. 
as we all know. Um, so I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on Twitter, and there's some ideological reasons for some of those decisions as well. Um, and when I'm on LinkedIn, I feel like I'm working, even though I spend a bit of time on it. So it's a, it's a platform that I sort of go to to sort of refresh and also put up some content. So it's it's the place I've dedicated my time to, and it's a purposeful choice around that. And what I'd say is, and uh, you, you'll get a copy of these slides too, having a plan around impact and who you're trying to reach and how you're trying to reach them and why you're trying to reach them um, is really, really significant. So, um, and, and increasingly funding bodies will ask for evidence of impact, uh, your, your school will look at impact and it's something that you can include in, in CVs and demonstrating sort of uh, the dissemination uh, of your research. So. This is an interesting paper published recently, and it just gives a nice template for you to work through. So the first question I'd sort of put out there, a thing to think about uh, is the idea of, of choice and, and where you're gonna go and where you're gonna invest your time. The second C then, um, if that strategy is working for me, is it, can you see that okay? Yeah, we can. Perfect. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll do it this way. Um, the the second C is customize. So we've touched on this. Is you can play with the URLs. You can change your LinkedIn um address to include your name. You can use your hashtags. You can use mentions. Uh, you can tag your school, tag your network, tag your community, um, tag your alumni network. So it's that customization that that begins to target a little bit, and it also means people, um. Like LinkedIn for me, instead of keeping a CV, I largely use LinkedIn as a sort of my my live CV. So I might include it on my email as a, as a signature. I may include it when I'm I'm, I'm being signed up for, as an extern for somewhere else. Uh, it's just a handy place to have a bio to pass on to someone uh, rather than necessarily using your university uh, web page or similar. So that, that's the purpose I use it for. And um, Bex made the very same metaphor here that the. the the thing about LinkedIn is it, it is the old Rolex. It is when you go to conferences and you used to come back with all those business cards and you're trying to remember who's who and who you met and who you were talking to over coffee, who you were talking to in the bar. And um, what I do is when I come back from somewhere or if I attend an event and I, I got talking to someone or I really like a speaker, LinkedIn is my default. So I connect with them on LinkedIn and that in that way, if I'm thinking in two years time, who was at that seminar? Uh, who was, what company was that individual working for again? I wonder, are they still at Microsoft? I wonder, are they still with the Irish government? Um, I can track them. So it, it's it's a database of people that I can search through. And some people are really good at networking. Some people have a great memory uh, for, for, for names and faces. I don't. Um, so it actually helps me in terms of my memory deficit uh, of, of who people are and where they are and how we may be able to connect. Um, LinkedIn has uh, groups that you can go into. So we have groups connected to our business school, uh, different associations. So the, say the American or British or European Academy of Management, they, all their interest groups may have subgroups. Uh, Bex mentioned the journals will have subgroups. So you, you can find a community there and um, just think about what groups you want to join and then you get their sharing of, of information. And one thing as well, I suppose, it's been very handy for me over time and I've been program director of a few programs, is using LinkedIn to keep up with our alumni. So this is a, a message I got on LinkedIn a few weeks ago from one of our alumni. Thanks for following, and I've just deleted the company name, my new company. It's exciting, I've joined as a HR lead three months ago. Hope all's well with you. I enjoy following your posts, uh, part-time master students from 2010, 2012. Um, so there is absolutely no way that I'd know what that student is doing now. And here we are now making connection. I actually emailed her and said, I'm involved in a project at the moment about uh, HR transitions and how people move in from one role to another or one company to another, would you be interested in doing the research? And she's like, yeah, that would be fantastic. Look forward to the conversation. So not only connecting with the alumni, but actually helping our research with the alumni. Um, so it's a mutual benefit, if you like, from um, from LinkedIn. So that's, that's the idea of connect. Um, Another C I'll, I'll bring forward here is 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 to capture or collate. So um, I've got funding logos on this. I'm involved in an EU funded project and they're always looking for us to evidence what we're doing and how we're doing it and why we're doing it. And 
I don't know if I'm a pessimist, but I'm always thinking, what happens if we get audited? And what happens if the EU comes knocking on our door and they've given us over a million euro? How do we demonstrate that we've got the word out there or try to get the word out there? So LinkedIn is my capture collate. So I can go through LinkedIn and every time we have something with, it's called Global Entrepreneurial Talent Management, uh, mouthful, uh, it's, it's a research innovation staff exchange project, um, five partners, 100 researchers, um, four years, uh, fantastic project. And every time we have a project output, I stick it on LinkedIn and I put the mention of the project. And what that simply means is when I'm tracking back to look at, God, what did we do? What was that event again? Who attended it? Uh, where was it? What was the date? LinkedIn is my library, if you like. It's it's my record keeping. And it's the same for my CV, to be honest. Um, what I do now is um, if I'm going for a promotion or I'm going for research funding, I'll scroll through my LinkedIn posts as a record of where I've been, what I've done, who I've talked to, what company I was working with. Um, and I found that really, really useful. So for me, as I said, it's it's a bit of a personal library uh, and it just keeps me on record. Now also the EU wants us to disseminate this project. So it's really important that we get the message out there. So for me, it ticks a few boxes uh, in terms of the capture and collate and just get the, the messaging of the project of a project out there. So I'm trying to see which C I did next. Yeah, okay. Um, communicate what you're doing as a school, uh, as a PhD group, as, as an early career. I'm involved in this project. So this was a message around, we worked with local SMEs with students doing a strategic analysis. I was able to tag all the SMEs, thank them for their time, give them a bit of profile and say, look, didn't the students do a great job? Wasn't it great to work with you? It highlights that DCU, uh, similar to yourselves, have the small business charter. So it's it's playing on that line as well, emphasizing our work with small business, uh, emphasizing our connection with the community. And it's also a way of publicly saying thanks. Uh, so hopefully maybe you might work with us again because we've really enjoyed this and maybe we've given you a bit of profile. Um, calling out um, projects that colleagues are doing. Um, and equally, this was a McKinsey report on, on um, managers and, and the deficiency of management and, and basically um, that dealing with your manager is the most stressful part of your work day and I use this as a bounce for promoting our MSc and saying look want to improve your management skills want to improve your people management uh, think about some of our master programs here's our open day so you can be quite clever in terms of using a message for one thing to do multiple things at the same time not in simply in your benefit, but for the benefit of the school, promotion of programs, uh, promotion of uh, a research event or a research project. So that's to communicate. Um, again, I, I probably don't need to go through all these. Call out is, is again, International HR Day. We said, how can we again keep up conversation with our alumni? Well, let's acknowledge them. We've, we've fantastic HR programs. We've over 2000 alumni. So every international HR day, we sort of call out, listen, you're doing a great job. You're leading during the crisis. Uh, we've, we, by the way, we still have three master's programs. We've got great faculty and we're doing leading research. Uh, don't forget about us. Um, and maybe some of your junior HR colleagues might want to come on one of our programs. Um, this was me before Christmas. I thought early in the pandemic, we, we did a lot. In, in celebrating and recognizing those working on the front line, including nurses. And I, I know from an Irish perspective, I thought that faded away. And um, so we did over December uh, across, had a conversation with a few colleagues. And let's just say thanks to people. So here, this is just a post saying thanks to the true heroes uh, and, and using that Banksy sort of um, NHS thank you. And basically saying, let's recognize those that have really been at the forefront of, of, of what's going on and, and helping us in terms of navigating that. So societal messaging as well. So it, if there's something on my mind or if there's something that I feel, wow, I don't, I don't think, it's, it's just my platform for saying, actually, look, this is what I'm thinking and these who, people I think should be recognized. With all these platforms, there's an opportunity for cross sell So we obviously have ResearchGate now, we've ORCID in terms of messaging, um, people's output and publications. Most universities will have some form of online access for pre-published versions of, of articles or book chapters. So particularly 
LinkedIn, it does have a big practitioner audience. You want to make it as easy as possible for them to find your work and find out about you and find out about the projects that are ongoing. So if you can link to a free online uh, repository uh, for an article or a book chapter, brilliant. Um, it's a benefit to everyone uh, in terms of being able to, to read your work. So that's, I'm, I, as I talk, I realize maybe I'm more of a marketer than a HR person. <laughs> um, what I found useful on LinkedIn in terms of conversations uh, is visuals, as Beck said as well, but asking questions or playing with a title. So here I've got, um, does culture eat strategy for breakfast? That classic sort of uh, quote that's always inappropriately um, linked to Drucker. Um, and I've got food for thought. Um, this is Maradona about monetary theory. And I said, really, he had a hand in everything. It's just my bad sense of humor, to be honest. Um, I think my wife is probably glad that I do it on LinkedIn and not at home. But if you can just try and make something interesting. So this was a post about biases. Uh, and I said, we are all biased about our bias. And that prompted actually huge conversations and a lot of emails back and forth and messaging on LinkedIn. And uh, the people wanted a copy of this graphic, which is publicly available. So you, you, I suppose you can have a bit of fun um, with, with what's going on and, uh, and disseminating what's out there. Um, final few points, again, just conscious of the time. Um, we obviously sign up for a lot of alerts, Harvard stuff, MIT, journal alerts. Increasingly for me, where I see content is actually on LinkedIn. So I get the first line of sight of articles that I use for teaching or research through LinkedIn. And this is to the point that I think there's more academic conversations happening on LinkedIn. And obviously it's a function of the groups that you follow. So um, Harvard Business Review, just follow them and you'll get detail of the most recent blogs, articles. And this is from Bex's journal, Human Resource Management Journal, putting out a call for paper, papers recently for um, provocation pieces or review papers. Now, I wasn't aware of this. Now, I saw it later come in through an email, but this this came in and I was like, wow, this is really interesting. I, 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 I hadn't seen this. And even sometimes your own institution. So the, the final picture here is um, about virtual internship project that um, we were doing, um, some of my great colleagues were doing, and uh, I didn't even know the project was happening. So um, probably a function of us all being online at the time. And it was really important, virtual internships, how you onboard people coming into organizations. So I'm actually learning what my, not only what people are researching, what people are looking for for research, but equally what my colleagues and, and my business school are doing. So it's, it's a good way to, for me to keep a track of uh, university level stuff. Um, my passion is SMEs. Uh, small firms, management development for small firms. So I consolidate that message. Um, this was a, a factory in Ireland that sadly burnt down last year, but they've miraculously come back into production already. Uh, and, and one of the quotes from the CEO was achieving the impossible. And just a link to an article on, on, on how they were all helped and the sense of community uh, in, in our SMEs working together. So it's something that I do and again, I use biomimicry a lot in my teaching and I will use biomimicry to uh, get SME owner managers to reflect on their experiences, particularly through the pandemic. Um, so I just say, look, great to work with SMEs and, and use 3. billion years of insights from nature to help us further understand their challenges and their growth. Um, and that helps me consolidate my area of expertise and the areas that I'm interested in. I'm nearly there now. Um, this is uh, another C. I think I've gone past seven now. I've probably lost count. I added a few uh, this morning. Um, celebrate. Um, and this is really, really clever. And I, I'm not sure if it is our actual university present or whether it's the marketing team. I sort of hope it's the marketing team. But um, we've had our graduations this week. And under a lot of the LinkedIn posts, we have our university present there, Dara Kyo, saying congratulations. And, and the impact of that on students is just huge. So congratulations, Michelle, it's a wonderful opportunity for you. Thank you so much, I really appreciate this. So it's just a really nice personal touch um, for the president of a university to be messaging. We had, we made a commitment 
which um, I think was fantastic for any student that didn't have a physical graduation that we'd offer it to them. And, and it was really pleasing this week that the first three days we graduated, I think it was nearly 4,000 students. And again, just promoting that message on LinkedIn. And this is a post by our educational trust. So like every university, we're obviously trying to raise funds and raise awareness of what we're doing, particularly for disadvantaged students, students on access programs. Um, and this is just another way to get that message out there. Look, we made a commitment and there's a little bit of differentiation here because some Irish universities maybe didn't do this. So we want to say, look, we, we're, we're student focused, we're student centered, and that's, that's the messaging we want to get out there. Um, and then you can celebrate, I mean, this probably is a bit of self-promotion, but um, you can celebrate your own success. And, and I was fortunate recently to be sort of asked to be associate editor for this journal. And um, I wanted to promote the journal. I wanted to promote that it's important for us as a business school because it's an international journal. And equally, I suppose, if you see, if you can see that picture, there's a little small Irish flag there. And I, then, I like everyone, we're proud of our nation. So I thought that was important as well, just to, to, to emphasize the diversification and the diversity needed maybe in, in some of these journals. And a lot of people picked up uh, jokingly on sort of flying the flag and great to see Ireland represented and, and these type of things. So for yourself or for others, I think it's, it's a lovely way to, to, to recognize things uh, that are going on. So I think I've, I've two more slides, so bear with me. Um, final C is, is Sometimes we run events, say like this one, um, uh, or conferences, um, and we let the moment pass. And, and it's a bit like, I suppose, when we publish a paper, sometimes we get we so much focus on the publication piece that actually I think that's the end, when in a way we should think about it's sort of the beginning, because now we need to get the message out there and disseminate it. And I think Bex had some great ideas with videos and different ways to get your message out there. But we can also reflect backwards. So we were really fortunate three years ago uh, to host a big conference in DCU, uh, HR Division of the Academy of Management. And um, just a post here, little did we know how privileged we were to be able to spend sort of time with this amount of delegates. So I'm, I'm promoting the school, I'm promoting the division, and equally there's a, there's a new conference forthcoming. And I link to, if you're really interested, here's another opportunity coming. So um, you can commemorate and, um, commemorate in both senses of the word. So I was very fortunate to uh, accept a research award on, on behalf of my supervisor who'd passed away a few years previously, uh, Professor Willie Brown from Cambridge. Um, and again, just to sort of acknowledge his work and, and just say, look, you still have a legacy. Your legacy is really important to the field uh, and to acknowledge that. And I think that's really, really important. And, and again, this was just another way to, to do that um, or I found useful to do that. So um, by way of uh, summary, and again, sorry, I've probably gone a little bit over there. Um, three C's for action now. Um, I think the choice thing is really important. The platform, also maybe where you are you're in your career in terms of the timing and, and how much you want to dedicate to this. The audience as, as, as came up as part of the last conversation, really, really important. Uh, and the type of impact you, you need or want to make. And particularly if you've got a funding body, and I saw one of the questions asked uh, on the chat was about this is, yeah, I think some of the measures are, are gonna be superficial, but it's very hard to measure dissemination. So even as a starting point, if you can say, there was a few thousand likes on this post, we tagged the funding agency here, here and here, the reach was, um, it's better than nothing. It's a starting point uh, and it's a beginning of conversation. How we've changed people's behavior and things, that, that's a different type of impact and, and maybe something that we can't tr do necessarily through social media. But social media can be the catalyst for those conversations, as I sort of emphasize with that um, email from the alumni. I think one thing, if, if, if you're going to make a choice, it's consistency. So and we find this with our own research centers that sometimes there's a big push and we all do blogs and, and then it can sort of fade away and then people won't go back to them. So I think if you're going to decide to be on a platform, my argument would be be consistent. So look, I don't post on LinkedIn every day. I think I post it maybe once or twice a week on it. Um, but I do at least that. So people will expect that I, and, and that's interesting for me as well. And that's to the final point is, 
this is new ish it's emerging um we're engaging with it more and more um and i think as as it was on the chat there there's more digital natives coming through as researchers obviously so it's a place to experiment to see what works what doesn't work it's a place to co-create it's a place to observe what's happening and equally it's a place to uh, enjoy so one of the key privileges that i feel we have as academics is we get to share knowledge and insights and we get to spend time thinking about things and reading about things and a lot of the time you know for many years i, I probably did that in a dark cave to myself you know oh this is great insight and now i'm saying look if i find something interesting might as well use it and, and share it and, and if it's of interest or helps one company or person fantastic um so it, it, for me it's actually quite enjoyable and saying and the final thing i've got a bookcase there and, and someone said to me years ago if you go into a bookshop what section do you go to first or if you're alone and you're on your own and you're wandering around a bookshop where do you spend your time and i was like um, yes yeah, it's, it's an interesting question uh, why and it's because that's where your interest is that's where you gravitate to that's where your attention pay attention to what you pay attention to so sometimes our engagement with social media and for example maybe reflecting on what i post it helps me understand what i'm interested in and what i enjoy doing so there's there's probably a lot of scope for self-learning uh, on the back of it so certainly it's for impact and certainly it's for our careers and all these type of things and enhancing the visibility of what we're doing how we're benefiting others what our schools are doing but also for me i think it's really important that it's actually a sense of enjoyment as well that's that's a platform for you to engage with the wider world if you like so if that's not too grandiose, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Brian. And you had 12 C's, not seven. Okay, yeah, that, that's why it was, that's why it was a lot longer. <laughs> we loved every single one of them. And I was speaking, I was trying to think, which one do I really like? I like the capture collate because it's just a good way to have a dump um, of what you're doing and just to be able to be accountable and to track uh, trends even with your own career and um, professional life as well. So I I'm sure you've been scanning through, looking through the chat box and reading the questions. We're going to take a few of them. I know that uh, Bex has kindly answered a few, but if I could just throw this in, I remember many years ago when uh, social media was just becoming re a big thing and someone said to me that if you were watching a TV program and all you got was commercials and breaks and advertisements and all that, you might not enjoy Enjoy what is being said. So like Brian ended um, with that to say that even though we're trying to give visibility to our research, we still have to make sure that we're not overdoing it, but we have to punctuate it with other things of interest, sharing other people's posts, giving visibility to stuff that other people are doing, connecting with our alumni. That was great. And I, I reckon that if we did two of this 12, maybe we just do um, use the 12 C's as a um, guide for content. And we even did two of them every month. We would have very rich content and be consistent with it. So thank you so much. OK, so Bex, um, do we want to spotlight Bex and maybe tackle some of the questions? Or does anybody from the floor want to um, unmute themselves and ask their questions directly before we then go and read the questions? If you, can, if you want to speak, you can raise your hand and ask your question. Shall I add to the, one of the questions and while people are thinking about whether to raise their hand and then they, then they can. I'm, a, I'm an extreme extrovert, so I find silence very uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so um, yeah, I think there were some really interesting questions. Um, and when Brian was talking, I was also thinking about how I use LinkedIn. And I, there was one question that's just come up actually, uh, Mark uh, Mark Gray mentioned uh, the, the, like how to use social media to do research and I think there are um, kind of uh, yeah different levels of this of course uh, uh, you can use data collected through social media you know social media data itself but I think just to reiterate what Brian said about his example of connecting with alumni I use research a lot when I'm trying to get access to organizations and sometimes I don't even it might be just to test out an idea. 
So if I have a new research idea and I want to, like all my research is field based, I should say. So for me, I'm normally looking for organisations to partner with and I use LinkedIn to try and like think, OK, what, who have I got on here? Who might be interested? And sometimes it might end up just being a short conversation which doesn't go anywhere. But I just kind of it's like a proof of concept from a, from the, a practitioner perspective, which I find really, really helpful. So I do think it's also kind of worth thinking about the kind of different uh, layers through which you can use uh, LinkedIn for research to kind of connect with people. Um, so that was just a reflection on that. And I have a question actually, you talked about hashtags, both of you talked about hashtags um, to give visibility to the right audience and how many is too many? So do you have a guide, like how many would you recommend in a post? And you know, I see people tag a lot of people, even when the, the people they are tagging are not really included in the post or the post does not concern them. What, what is your advice on who to tag and how many people should you be tagging? Yeah, I, I, can, I, can I jump in there? Yeah, um, yeah. I think I think it's a really good point, and I think you can overdo it. So obviously, your institution and who's involved, and I, I think I don't know if there's a, a fix, but I'd never have more than three or four, on, uh, unless I was saying, say, if it was a Bex published a paper in a, in a special issue a while back, and and we tagged everyone in the special issue because we're basically saying papers are out. Isn't this great? Look at this. I was free. A lot of the papers were open access, so. In that instance, I suppose people were would would be happy, but I suppose it depends on what the post is. You know, if it's I think if it's a it's a if it's a journal, you put your name out there. It's a publicly available. It's probably okay. But if I'm making a point about something, and it comes to a point in the chat about sort of personal uh, issues, um, I tend to wait, rein back in a little bit, and 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 maybe just speak about me and not tag. So um, there's a there's a judgment call there. Yeah, certainly. It's an important point. Okay, and, and just said, uh, in the chat, people like to be tagged. It's recognition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it is, but I, I agree with Brian. I'm very sparing with her, who I tag and when I tag them. I, some people, for example, tag me and say things like, Bex, you're it. I'm interested to know your perspective. And I kind of like it, but I also don't because I feel pressure to give a perspective <laughs> and to be insightful. But it's sort of nice that they're asking my opinion. So I like that as well. So I, yeah, it's sort of it's nice. And your question about hashtags. Um, on LinkedIn, you don't you can like chuck them down the bottom, which is what I always do, because I hate personally, I'm an incredibly visual person and I really hate hashtags in the middle of text. I find it very distracting because my eyes drawn to that. that. <laughs> so what I do for HRMJ is I put all my hashtags down the bottom um, because then it pops up on people's feeds if it's relevant to them, uh, but it's not distracting from the text. And then you can put quite a lot if you want to and it doesn't matter. So that would just be my tip on LinkedIn in particular. On Twitter, of course, you, it has to be kind of, because it's short, you have to use it within it. And I really, again, I'd be pretty sparing with using hashtags. Okay, thank you. And there's a couple of comments about ResearchGate, about people using ResearchGate to give visibility to your research. I know that probably we won't consider it social media, but it's, it's an outlet as well that is out there that people can read. And so how do you balance that? You know, um, yeah, I, I don't know if you saw Colette's question. So should we go to you first, Bex? Uh, yeah, sure. I, so I do use re, uh, ResearchGate, but I don't use it as social media. So you can, of course, you can. It, it, had, it, it has discussion for, which I, I search on. I do often find answers to questions I have on ResearchGate. And I think once I've posted a question, so that's very helpful. Um, and you can follow people's work and you can comment on people's work. I don't do any of that. I just use it as a repository for my research. So when I have a new paper, I do put it on ResearchGate, but that's mainly because Google Scholar links to it and then people can find it more easily. to be honest that's the reason. Um, I agree I think I can't remember if it was Colette or someone else said it's kind of annoying that, that when people ask you lots of uh, yeah it's difficult to keep up to date with re requests for papers. I agree I find that a bit hard as well. I noticed I had like two years of requests back later so I don't really engage with that very much if I'm honest. I think I think with ResearchGate and I see there's a comment about Publons as well. Um, what's useful for me sometimes is is the evidence base under it. So when you go down to ResearchGate and you go under the paper and it starts giving you the number of views and where people have come from and, and, and those type of things, I think can be quite interesting. And, and for peer review, 
I find like you give so much time and there's no recognition. And Publons, if you you want to use it, is basically saying, do you know what, Brian, you did 10 reviews last year. And where that might be useful for someone sort of starting out in their career is it gives you a percentage as well. So what quartile you're in and how much you're, what, where you're reviewing. So say if you're putting in for a job or an application, it's, it's not going to make or break anything. But if rather than say I review for a number of journals, you list the journals and say my pub if your pub on stat is something you want to call out it maybe it isn't but if it is put it in your pub on stat and say i'm in the 85 percent top uh, reviewer within my field based on pub on it won't do you any harm and if the messaging is sort of nice because we can say a lot of things without an evidence base mm. so i think you just particularly for applications or for funding if, if an evidence base helps you fantastic and that's really interesting because I think it's, it segues ni nicely to my next um, question about many of us here, are early career researchers, PhD students, and, you know, we don't really have those papers to publish and um, to share on LinkedIn or Twitter, as you've uh, mentioned in your presentation. So it's really about positioning, trying to balance the move to academia, share something without disseminating our research before it is published. What advice do you have for us? And Schmidt, we'll start with Brian. Yeah, I suppose a lot of what I research isn't my research uh, or what I, a lot of what I send out. So I, I'll repost like Harvard Business Reviews or, or Strategy in Business. And, and I'll actually say to my students, uh, look, it means nothing to me, but if, if you want to stay up to date with content that's relevant to the course, I do post a lot on LinkedIn and that that's where you'll get information from me. So. I think like if you're doing a PhD on, on entrepreneurship and, and there's there's an article on, you know, trends in entrepreneurship or wow, isn't investment in entrepreneurship has increased in the pandemic, which is really interesting. You, you, you're putting out your, you are positioning, do you know the kind of way? Because you're sort of, you're, you're showing people that this is my topic. This is my area of interest. So um, I, I, I don't think you should ever really um, put out unpublished work, especially now because a lot of journals will, 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 will can scan and see that something's there, but that's not to say you can't put out a question or, or one particular point. So, uh, so uh, it might be something you talk to a supervisor about, or if you're unsure of, you, you definitely cross check. But um, yeah, I think an imprint of of the type of field and area that you're interested in, I think, is is the way I think about it. So, it's a portfolio of things that you're posting that are related to your topic. OK, and there's the questions about other kind of, um, you know, outlets like academia.edu and maybe I should link that up with things like the conversations and all that. So what are your thoughts on that? And Bex, you'd uh, probably give your view on that. Yeah, um, I mean, academia academia.edu, I remember I created an account when I was at Birkbeck and I think I probably haven't looked at it since, so I honestly can't say much about that. Um, as far as things you, you mentioned, things like the conversation, I think the conversation is very similar to places like Forbes and they're these kind of, um, I would say, um, I was going to say higher quality, but how am I evaluating quality? They're well read, they kind of are a bit more um, uh, selective about what, what is uh, uh, kind of what they share in there. I think they are seen as high quality from a practitioner perspective. So I think if you're kind of wanting to engage with practitioners, then those kind of outlets are very helpful um, but you have to have a, have a story you have to have something you want to share and you have to be also willing to stand by that right I mean I, I think obviously um, sometimes we publish something and then later might think oh actually I've changed my mind on that that's fine that we're human but I think if you're you the process of going through research and having it peer reviewed and publishing it means that you are scrutinised and you really have to properly think about what you're doing. We can obviously critique the peer review process as well. But if you're just if you're writing an article for a practitioner outlet or a blog post, there's less scrutiny. So you have to do that yourself. And I would really I do think you have to we have to do that. Really think about what we're saying. OK, and there's a specific question for you, Bex, from Helen uh, to ask, have you examples of follow up from highlighting practitioner implications in HRM and um, because they're with regards to impact to policy and practitioner audiences um, to CIMR, of course? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm trying to think. I would. Yeah, that's a very good question. I don't think we track that very much within the journal. I think if we asked our authors, they may have some examples 
um, because I think one of the things about HRMJ is there are a lot of uh, very kind of practically prescient questions that are that are tackled within the research that's published in the journal. I don't know. It's a very good question. I think it's something that whether we should think about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um, Brian, do you have anything to say to the conversations, uh, paid publications, and all that? While I'm scrolling through the questions in the chat box and scrolling from the bottom up. <laughs> Yeah, look, I think there's a lot. There's a lot of content that comes in about the paid publication. I don't think there's recognised within management or organisations generally. I don't think there's, as far as I'm aware, sort of a reputable outlet necessarily. I mean, I think it's a model that comes from sciences, where, where you pay and it's part of the sort of the, the diagrams and the data and all that sort of stuff. So um, I'd be extremely cautious on that front. Academia, Daddy, Ed, you, I. My understanding was it was like a research gate and then they went to a paid model and I, got, I started getting so much spam from them recently actually I've um, and this is just a personal thing I, I sort of I'm no longer involved if you like I don't I don't know what the network is um, yeah okay and so um, another question from Frederick to say that Bookbex and Brand have highlighted how personal in quotes piece of news rises interest in networks is it fair, including this kind of issues when disclosing research results? How can it be done? Specs? Uh, yeah, so maybe I guess just to clarify, and maybe I misunderstood the question, so you can tell me if I did. I would certainly not disclose anything about research participants unless uh, there were, unless, for example, it was with a case organisation and they had given permission for that. Of course, you know, research ethics is like number one. So I think when I say personal stories, um, again, it's only really with people's permission. So with the journal, I'm only sharing personal stories when they are something that is out in the public domain, that is non-controversial, those kind of things. If I'm sharing personal stories about me, again, I think uh, Brian made the point about tagging earlier, and I think I would only tag people if I knew that they would be happy for me to tag them in, in the post. So I don't kind of uh, make make other people's personal stories kind of uh, known, if you see what I mean. And certainly, yeah, on the research side of things, I wouldn't. OK. Um, I, I'll just go to the last questions. We're fast running out of time. I, I thought we had way too much time, but well, people are really interested and um, practitioners. OK, so I don't think we have any more questions and I'll just hand back to you guys as for your final, uh, your last words or charge to us and what next we should do. So Brian? Yeah, well, look, I think it's it's great that you put on this session because I think we we as academics maybe talk too much about research and we don't talk about the surround sound, including teaching and, and techniques. Um, so I think this has been really interesting. Um, just actually, I'm, I'm just looking at that comment there. And yeah, I think um, I don't see academics and, and practitioners as, as, as different universes at all. And in fact, I actually like the term pracademic because I think if you're conducting any bit of research on anything you're engaging with practice so I, I think the, the, the and we have to learn from practice and, and I think LinkedIn is also useful in things like um, monitoring employment trends and, and jobs and where people are going and what learning trends are so I suppose for me it's 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 back to the it's very easy to become overburdened with all this um, and it's not to try and do too much. Um, so what works for you? Where would you like to go? And what impact are you trying to have? And you can build up something gradually. Uh, as we all know, it's it's harder to get traction straight away. So um, experiment, learn, and, and most importantly, um, enjoy it and have fun and build a nice network. And don't, don't uh, I was reading earlier on funny about the personal issues comment, like you don't have to be connected with people that you don't agree with their sentiment or that are gonna say negative things. And so you, you in some now that this can create an echo chamber too, but in some ways you can you can create your own network and diversity of networks. So we have our alumni network and, and I can post to our HR alumni network on LinkedIn. And frequently that's jobs. So someone will email me and say, Brian, we have a HR job. Can you post it to the alumni network? That for me is the perfect win-win for a university because you're keeping in touch, you're helping someone that's an alumni, and you're also helping other alumni by giving them uh, details of job opportunities. So th there's a lot of wins, but um, yeah, that 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 sea of choice for me is is very significant. Thank you so much, Brian and Bex. Yeah, I would I would say the same, and I also uh, I think I very much echo Brian's comments. I was also thinking that be selective. I I think. Um, 
I probably would consider myself relatively generous with how I engage with people on social media. Like if someone sends me a message, I will respond to it. I, you know, even if I think it's completely way out the ballpark, I would just kind of say like, OK, really great. I'm probably not the right person, you know, that kind of thing, just to, because I think that's important. If I'm asking them to engage with me, I engage back. But I also think there is there is very much a balance. And I think not feeling the pressure to uh, engage with everything or everyone right sometimes it's just okay to scroll that's fine and take your time and think about what you want to say thank you so much bex and i think the message rings true choose your audience so if i can say to everyone um still in attendance everyone on this um workshop today to say get back to your rooms or to your offices decide what your audience is what they would like what um you want to post to them and what you want to share to them, when you should post, what hashtags they use, that would be a great start. And with that, we will hand back to Professor Lawton smith Well, thank you, Doreen. Uh, thank you, Bex. Thank you, Brian. Absolutely brilliant. I've had so much feedback on, on my own email from, from this. And thank you, Doreen.